has always been a part of the human experience, so much so that early on in the Bible it talks about not lying because it's something that people tend to do, but it seems like it's becoming more and more a part of our culture. If any of you have watched any uh, on, you know, on TV or online court cases in the last year, there were probably moments where you said, he's lying, she's lying, or they're all lying, right? That, that, that's the world we live in, where lies just seem to be part of things and people, ah, it wasn't me, and, and just, you know... There's just lots of that. It's become almost normal. It used to be that when people would watch the news, they would fundamentally trust what the news people were saying. Some of you remember those days. Now when you watch almost any kind of news, there's, there's a new term that people use called fake news. And, and it seems like you go, well, a bunch of you just, how do you know if these people are telling the truth? It used to be fundamentally trustworthy. Now people are wondering, are they lying? Are they, are they telling part of the truth or none of the truth? It used to be that people sort of had a sense of trusting those in the political world, and not quite so much anymore. That's just the world we live in. So you can become cynical, and you can become cautious. And, and I want to talk today, and in the next couple of weeks, about some lies that need to be exposed. Some lies that if we don't recognize them, and face them, and deal with them, we'll find ourselves in all kinds of trouble. And the lie we're going to look at today is a lie that you find all the way back at the beginning of the Bible. If you have a Bible or if you have a Bible app, you can go to, go to Genesis chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'll have, the, we'll have the words and the passages on the screen, and I'll read them for you as well. But we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3 and talk about this lie. My sin won't catch up with me or cost me. My sin, you know, I can do things, I can think things I shouldn't think and say things I shouldn't say and do things that don't honor God. I can fail to do the good things God wants me to do. I can rebel against God, and you know what? No big deal. My sins aren't going to catch up with me. It's not going to cost anything. And we can tell ourselves, it's just me personally. It doesn't affect anybody else. But the reality is, that's simply not true. In Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 14. I want you to listen to this story. Now, the first two chapters of Genesis are just God creating the heavens and the earth and making everything. And you've got this man, you've got this woman, you've got this beautiful garden, you've got paradise. And things are going great. God shows up and walks in the garden with Adam and Eve, and there's peace in the world. But then something changes. I want you to listen to this story. If you've heard it before, I want you to listen with fresh ears. If you've never heard it, then just listen and ask yourself, what's going on here when it comes to lying and telling the truth? What are the lies, and what is the truth that we see in this passage? Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? It's one of Satan's favorite tactics, to come to you and say, Did God really say that? I mean, really? Is that really the way you're supposed to live your life? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden. All, you know, we may eat from any of these trees in the garden. Uh, right? But God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. Satan responds. You will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from and your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. The enemy says you won't die. This is going to be awesome. Incredible. Fantastic. Wonderful. A lie. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband because not only does misery love company, but sin loves company, right? She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. 
Next come some of the saddest words in the entire Bible. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden before they ran to God and walked with God. Now they ran away from God and hid from God. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. So I hid. And at that point, he said, God says to him, who told you that you were naked? And God asked Adam, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And Adam said, yes, I have. I'm really sorry. I confess it right now. I admit to it. Right? No. No. Verse 12. The man said, and listen to this. The man said, the woman you put here with me. Are you picking this up? God says, Adam, did you eat from the tree? And the fingers pointing begins. The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Let's blame God and let's blame the woman. Let's not take any personal responsibility, right? Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman says, I'm guilty as well. No, she says, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, and then God gives some consequences, consequences for the serpent, consequences for the woman, consequences for the man, consequences for all the human family, because sin had come into the world. Living God, we pray that as we look at your word today, you will speak the truth to us in this world filled with lies, in this world impacted by Satan, the, the father of lies, the one who lies all the time, because that's his native language. We pray that you will speak the truth to our hearts, that we will recognize the lies, the truth, and how to follow in your ways. We pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. As you look at the, this passage, what you understand is that God is beginning to expose the lie, exposing the lie. That's what we're going to do today. We want to expose this lie that's from the pit of hell, that's from the enemy of your soul, the one who wants to mess up your life, this lie that says... You, your sin will not be caught and your sin will not have any impact. When we sin against God, when we think thoughts that we shouldn't think, that's sin. When we say things we shouldn't say that don't honor God, that's sin. When we do things we know we shouldn't do, we know that don't honor God. And even if you don't believe in God, if you think, well, if there's a perfect God who is perfectly holy and every day does everything right, would he look at what I do and say everything I do is perfect? The answer is no. When we do those things we shouldn't do, we know we shouldn't do. The Bible says that's sin. When we, do, when we don't do the good things we ought to do, that, that the Holy Spirit nudges us, you should do this, and we say no, that's sin. But the enemy says your sin won't catch you and your sin won't cost you. No big deal. Nothing to be seen here. No consequences. That's a lie, and we have to face that lie. We have to expose that lie. Jesus came to cleanse us from sin. If you think sin doesn't matter, doesn't cost anything, then forget about Jesus being on the cross. Because he came to the cross to pay for our sins, to carry the cost. Sin costs so much, it costs the, the life of the only perfect lamb of God. Jesus, the son of God who gave his life for us. That's the cost of our sin. And we have to face that and recognize it and realize it. A great revivalist named Billy Sunday was known for this line, among many other lines. He said, one reason that sin flourishes, that sin keeps growing, is that we treat it like a cream puff instead of a rattlesnake. Isn't that a good picture? Ooh, a cream puff, delicious, tasty, mmm. But you also realize you're holding onto a rattlesnake. It has fangs and venom and will lash out at you. We can often treat sin like a cream puff instead of a rattlesnake because we don't understand the cost of sin. We have to address this. Another great quote that's been said by many different people, and I've heard this years ago, and it really struck me hard the first time I heard it, it is this. Sin always takes you farther than you want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay, and costs you more than you want to pay. Sin always costs more than we recognize. And so I want to invite you to do something. I want to invite you not to think about someone who's sitting next to you today in this sermon, not to nudge them and say, this is for you, not to be thinking about somebody you wish was here today or you wish was with you online watching,
But will you listen for you? Will you listen for you? And will you dare to say, God, if there's a pattern in my life of the way I talk, the way I think, the way I act, the, the, the things I don't do that I do that, aren't, that isn't honoring to you, that, would you help me today see what that sin is and see it for what it really does and the cost that I'm gonna really pay for that if I keep going down that road? Just quiet your heart right now. And if you're a Christian, would you just say, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, show me an area that I'm wandering into sin and I'm, I'm believing the lie that it's no big deal. Never gonna get caught, never gonna pay the price, never gonna have consequences. Will you speak the truth to me today? If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you're not yet a Christian, would you pray this prayer? God, if you're there, and if you love and care about me, if you're trying to protect me from damaging myself and damaging others, God, I open my heart and ask that you would speak to me today and help me see about transformation that needs to happen in my life as well. God, speak to each of our hearts, including me today, I pray, Jesus, in your name, amen. So exposing the lie, if you walk through Genesis chapter three, you're gonna see things that are gonna help you recognize it's kind of expose the lie that's there and how we need to address it and be aware of it. So in Genesis chapter three, verse one, exposing the lie, we see the source of the lie. The source of the lie in verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the women, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? When lies are present, Satan's present. Satan is a liar and the father of lies. The Bible says that when he speaks, his native language is lying. That's the enemy of your soul. And the, enemy of your, the enemy of your soul, Satan, wants nothing good for you. He wants to destroy, dismantle, and damage your life. The Bible says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. And so when, when lies are present, Satan is present. When lies are in your own mind or your own heart, Satan is at work trying to get you to walk down that road, exposing the lie. The start of the lie. Look at verse, chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 1 again. Says, the enemy says to the woman, did God really say? Did God really say? The enemy loves that tactic to question if God said something. Did God really say that when a man and a woman are in the covenant of marriage, they should be faithful to each other for all the days of the... Did God really say that? I mean... So many fish in the sea. You know, there's so, did God really say you should reserve yourself for this one person? To, did God really? I mean, come on. Seriously, did God say that? And the answer is yes, because God made us and he knows what's best. And we think we know what's best. And the enemy lies and says, oh, that's going to be great. That's going to be wonderful. Go for it. Did God really say that the best way to operate with other people is honesty and integrity in your business, in your banking, in your, in your financial dealings? Did God really address the issue of integrity and honesty. I mean, you can't get ahead in the world if you don't cut corners a little bit, right? I mean, come on, really, honestly. Did God really say that? The answer is yes. But, but, but the enemy comes and says to you, did God really say? And whatever that area was that's on your heart about an area in your own life that you might want to deal with sin, the enemy will come and say, but did God really say? Does it, does it really matter? You won't get caught. It won't cost you anything. Just go have fun. It'll be great. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Exposing the lie. How about this? You won't pay the consequences. That's what the enemy says. Look at verse four. Verse four begins with these words. The enemy says, you will not certainly die. That's a lie. Physical death and spiritual death come from sin. In Genesis chapter three. But the enemy says, oh, you won't pay the consequences. What a lie. We always pay the consequences. We always end up getting caught. Even if you think, well, I'll never get caught. Here's the reality. Nobody will ever know. Here's two people who know. You know and God knows. And that's enough. But here's, here's the other truth. Before time is done, almost everyone's going to know. When we believe the lie that we can keep those things hidden, we're believing the lies of the enemy. You won't get caught. No one's going to know. It's no big deal, the enemy whispers. Exposing the lie. It will be wonderful. What could be wrong with that? What could be wrong with you fill in the blank? Whatever it is you feel invited to do, enticed. Yeah, I know it's wrong. I know it's not what God's plan is, but the enemy, you believe those lies. It's going to be wonderful. And it will be. So look at verse three again. I mean, I'm sorry, verse five again. 
It says, for God knows, the enemy says, for God knows that when you eat from it, from this tree, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You'll finally see. You'll be like God. You'll have incredible wisdom. What's wrong with that? This is going to be great. That's what the enemy says. The enemy lies. The very thing that's going to kill us, the enemy tells us, will give us the best life. That's how deceptive Satan is. And we can eat it up, hook, line, and sinker, if we're not careful. We have to recognize the lies of the enemy. Exposing the lie. It looks good. It tastes good. It must lead to a good life. Look at verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Man, it looks good. It seems good. It seems attractive. You know, you're... you're in a covenant relationship in marriage, you're committed to your spouse, to your husband or to your wife. And the enemy says, but yeah, check her out. She's beautiful. And she, she cares about you. She'll be there for you. Not like the wife you have now. She, she, she's so, let me see how she, see how she looks at you, see how she admires you. Your wife, that, that sparkle's gone out of her eye. And the enemy just whispers these lies. And they're lies. You know, the old, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence because the truth is the grass is never greener on the other side of the fence. But, but the enemy wants us to think it is so we can jump over fence, over fence, over fence, over fence. And that becomes part of our lifestyle. Exposing the lie, it looks good, it tastes good, it must lead to a good life. I would encourage you to go back to Genesis chapter three in the coming days to read it through a couple of times and get the subtlety and the nature of the heart and the work of Satan. He is a liar and the father of lies. So that when sin and temptation comes, you, you start to think in a different way if you listen to his voice. Sometimes his voice sounds just like your voice. Sometimes you can tell it's the enemy whispering, but be careful and be aware. And then we not only need to expose the lie, but in this passage, God em- says embrace the truth. God gives truthful pictures about, about the reality of sin, the cost of sin, and the greatness of God's power. So embracing the truth, what does that look like? Well, embracing the truth. God reveals his best plan for our lives. Genesis chapter 3, verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden. But God did say, don't eat from that one tree in the center of the garden. So here's what the woman says. She says, God's put us in a garden. Have you ever noticed that what the Bible begins with, where people are in the beginning of the Bible? Paradise. Perfect paradise. Have you ever noticed where the Bible ends? Perfect paradise. That's what God wants for us. Sin gets in the middle and messes up what God has in mind. Sin messes with our lives, and the lies of the enemy mess with our lives. But, but if, if you look at this and you say, okay, embracing the truth, God reveals his best plan. The woman says, here's what God said. You can eat from all the trees in the garden, just not this one. And what are they focusing on? This one. <laughs> but here's the picture. God says, there's all these trees here. And there's a whole orchard over there. There's a whole vineyard over here. Just, just all these good things to enjoy. And we're like, mm-hmm. you know, kind of, we want to focus on, but, but stay away from that. And all of a sudden, that's where our attention is. But the picture is that God is a God who blesses. God is a God who has designed you to be in his paradise with him in a beautiful relationship. That's the heart of God. That's the desire of God. Sin creeps in and messes that up. Embracing the truth. God is God, and we are not. Genesis 3, 5. It says, For God knows that when you eat, from, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God is God, and we are not. God understands that there are boundaries. We often don't. God, in his love, says, Stay away from that. That'll kill you. All this. Is wonderful and good. Enjoy it. Drink it in. Be thankful for these good things, but avoid the things that will poison your soul. And Satan takes this poison thing and candy coats it and says, it's delicious. And too often we believe and we jump in. If you have parents who have a, who, they have a, a swimming pool, a little, little above ground pool, in ground pool, simple little pool, big pool, and they have kids that don't know how to swim, why do those parents put a fence around that pool or warn their kids to stay away from the pool if they can't swim. 
Why would a parent say to keep a child away from a pool if they can't swim? Because that parent is mean. That parent hates their children and wants to ruin their fun. Right? No. It's because they love the kid. They're trying to protect their life. The kid doesn't know how to swim. And if they fall in that pool, they're dead. Right? Why does God say, stay away from this? To ruin our fun. No. Because he knows what the best life looks like. And he wants you to have that kind of life. So God is God. He understands better than we do. He made us. He created the universe. So when God says, stay away from that, let's trust him, right? That's the truth. God knows more than we do. How do we embrace the truth? We have to recognize that my sin always hurts other people. My sin always hurts the people around me. Look at verses six and seven. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Her sin impacted his sin. His sin impacted her sin. And then their relationship began to be fractured because sin does that. When we walk down the roads that God doesn't have planned for us, when we live the way he doesn't want us to live, when we think the way he doesn't want us to think and talk the way he doesn't want us to talk and, and do the things he doesn't want us to do, It impacts us and the people around us. My sin always hurts other people. And then embracing the truth, sin leads to shame. Sin leads to shame. Look at verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. There was no shame before this moment, and now there was shame. Sin leads to shame. And when you walk in shame, it impacts everything around you. It impacts how you see yourself, how you see the world, how you see others. So when we sin, it brings shame. Not not so much because God heaps it on us, but because we recognize that that we're naked, we're exposed, we're living the way we shouldn't be living. Sin leads to shame. Embracing the truth. Sin always separates us from God. Always. In verses 8 through 10, there's this picture where God, who made them, who loves them, came to the garden like he had before. He came to the garden to walk with them, to be in fellowship with them, because that's the heart of the God who made us. That's the heart of the God of the Bible. He wants to walk with us, have a relationship with you, have a friendship with you, and create a place where you can walk with him and be in relationship. And that's what it was like before this moment. But now God shows up. He's walking in the garden just like he did before. And instead of running to him, they run away and they hide. That's the power of sin. It drives us away from God. Notice this. God still shows up. It's them that run away. As sin fills your life and you think God's left you, he hasn't. You're running from him. He's still there in the garden waiting. But they run and they hide. And it breaks the heart of God because he longs to be in relationship with his children. Embracing the truth. That sin fractures our relationship with others. Our sin fractures our relationship with others. Once they've entered into sin, and God says, Adam, have you you eaten the the, the fruit that I said not to eat? And he could blame it on anyone he wants, but at the end of the day, he ate the fruit. He was responsible. What does he do? He blames God, and he blames the woman. God, the woman you put here. If it weren't for her, if it weren't for you putting her here, I'd have been fine, right? Right? And then she gave it to me. And then she starts the blame game. And all the finger pointing starts. This is what sin does. It wasn't me. Because sin tends to lead to more sin to more sin. If you're not sure about that, read the story about David and Bathsheba. Where he begins by looking at this woman and lusting. Then he commits adultery. Then he has her husband killed. All the way trying to cover his path, cover his path, cover his path. But he can't cover his path. And sin leads to sin leads to sin. Embracing the truth. Sin drives us to lie, hide, and cover up. Sin creates nakedness, vulnerability, and it causes us to lie, to cover our paths, to cover ourselves, and it isolates us. Sin isolates us from the people we love the most and from the one who loves us the most, from God. Embracing the truth. Sin costs more than we ever imagine or expect. Sin costs more than we, ever, than we can ever imagine or expect. If you continue reading on in Genesis beyond where I've stopped reading, you see that now God says, okay, this is the cost of sin. And it's interesting. God says to Eve, to the woman, 
you will now have painful labor. And then he says to Adam, you will now have painful labor. The same word is used in the original language, the Hebrew language. The woman's going to have painful labor, painful child labor. The man's going to have painful labor, painful work by the sweat of his brow. But there is consequences to our sin. And we can try to act like there's not, but there is every single time we fall into it. So sin costs us more than we ever imagine or expect. Embracing the truth. Sin destroys the paradise God longs for us to experience. Adam and Eve are now moved out of paradise. So they won't continue on the path, the wrong path they had gone, the path of sin. Paradise is now lost. It's now gone. But God's design, God's desire, it's not an accident that the Bible begins in the first chapters of Genesis. The Bible begins in paradise with people with God in a perfect relationship. And you go to the end of Revelation, and what do you have? Paradise, where God's in perfect relationship with his children. That's the heart of God. That's the desire of God for you. But sin comes and blows that to pieces. Sin tears that apart. And so, we, we, ha- we have to you know, name it, recognize it, expose what sin is. And then we have to understand what the truth is and embrace the truth and hold to the truth. But then, we need to engage in God's good life. Because, okay, then how do I walk in the good life that God has planned for me? If God is a God who begins and ends things in paradise, if God is a God who's, who's offered Jesus to die on the cross to rise again, to pay for my sins so I can be with him forever in paradise, how do I walk into that? How do I live the way I need to live in relationship to battling against sin? So engaging in God's good life, number one, engaging in God's good life, don't chat with, listen to, or negotiate with the enemy of your soul. Don't chat with the enemy about these things. When you're about to go down a road, you shouldn't go down. And the Holy Spirit convicts your heart. He says, don't do it. It's going to blow your family apart. It's going to blow your life apart. It's going to damage you. It's going to damage your soul. And the enemy starts to say, oh, it's no big deal. You'll never get caught. No one's going to ever know. Everyone's doing it. It's normative in culture now. Go for it. Don't believe those lies. The woman starts in this conversation with the enemy, and it doesn't end well. Cut off those conversations. You say, that's a lie from the pit of hell. I know God's word. No, thank you. And you don't even have to say thank you on that one. You can just say no. Not doing it. Not going down that road. But don't chat with, listen to, or negotiate with the enemy of your soul. Number two. Engaging in God's good life, always project the worst consequences and stop, run for the hills, and say no early in the process. As you start to walk down a road of sin, whatever it is, sin in your relational world, in your financial world, in your sexual world, in any area, you start to walk down a road you know you shouldn't be walking down. Here's what you should do. This is a time where you should think the worst. Go, what's the worst thing that could happen if I do this? Because here's the reality, it's probably going to come down to that. When you say, what's the worst thing that could come out of this? If you go down that road, there's a very good chance that's where you're going to end up. So imagine, it'll do this to my kids. It'll do this to my, my own health. It'll do this to my relationships. It'll do this to my work life. It'll do, if, if this comes out and becomes public, and it probably will, this is what, I mean, imagine the absolute worst, and then stop and run. Make an exercise of imagining all it could cost you because you may end up going down that road and it's something you don't want to do. Here's the reality. When you are faced with temptation, the Bible's clear that being tempted isn't sin. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, Jesus was tempted, but he didn't sin. So you see something that looks tempting, and the enemy says, it'll be wonderful, it'll be great, but you know you shouldn't do it. When do you stop and turn around? Stop and turn around and run the other way the minute you start entertaining it. You know, you know what the time is to, to, to stop an affair? Women, married women. Here's the time you stop an affair. When you find yourself in the morning getting ready and getting dressed, and you're not thinking about how your husband will think how, about how you look. You're thinking about how that guy at your office or in the neighborhood, you're, you're getting dressed thinking, oh, he's going to think I look beautiful, and your heart is starting to go out to that. that you end the affair then. Not when you've been in the hotel room seven different times. And you're down that road. When do you stop embezzling? When do you stop stealing from your work or from your church or from other people? When do you stop embezzling? It's when you look and go, oh, I could get away with that. I could take that money. Nobody would ever know. That's when you stop. 
right then when you're just looking at it. You don't stop after you've got sixty or seventy thousand dollars that you've taken and it's been spent, and now you are stuck. There's there's no getting. When, how, when do you deal with your explosive anger? When you feel that heat start to raise up right here in your chest and your neck, and you feel your hands start to clench. That's when you deal with it. Not after you punch a hole in the wall or punch a hole in somebody else's soul. You stop when you start to feel it rising up. If we go too far, now it's... What? I don't do anything. Me? No. What are you talking about? That was there, that was there when I came in the room. Right? <laughs> when, you, when you get there... Now, is God's grace enough to heal even that? Yes. But I'm telling you, those of you that have, have come to the cross and received Jesus, the time you turn and run from those temptations is before you take the bite. It's when you're just noticing and starting down the road and you recognize it and you see it. And at that point, and can I tell you, get people around you and tell them I'm feeling enticed by this. Pray for me, talk to me, and ask me how I'm doing. I've had a couple of different men in my life who have come to me and actually said, I'm about to take a step in my business or my personal life. It's going to blow up my whole life if I take that step. Will you pray for me and ask me how I'm doing? And in most cases... Six months, a year later, they say, thank you. The temptation is gone. I didn't go down that road. Or in some cases, I've seen, and they've gone down the road, and it's like you dropped a hand grenade in the middle of their soul and their life and their family, and everything's blown to pieces. And God forgives, but the damage is still done. So we have to recognize the reality of sin. Engaging in God's good life. Trust God's plan. Follow Know and follow his word. If you want to get, say, oh God, I want to stay on your path and live for you, get to know this book. There's a reason why every single week, all year long, we provide a daily reading guide on our website, on our Shoreline app, for you to open this book and read it because this book speaks truth into our world filled with lies. Get to know the book, the word of God, and make sure you keep walking and living in God's ways. Engaging in God's good life. Let God cover your sins and protect you from the ultimate consequences. The Bible says the wages of sin, the cost of sin is death, spiritual death. But Jesus, but, 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 the, but the good gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can have your sins washed away by Jesus. When Jesus hung on the cross, nails through his wrists, nails through his feet, he took our sins, he took our shame, he took the punishment, and he died in our place for our sins on the cross. And when he rose again, Jesus broke the power of sin and death and hell. He paid the price. And you can have the ultimate payment for all your sins dealt with through Jesus Christ. If you're already a follower of Jesus, you've come to the cross, you've confessed your sins, you've received Jesus, you've taken his hand, you're now living for him, cleansed of your sins. If you're not yet a Christian, can I tell you something? The arms of Jesus are wide open to you. And the price he paid was enough for all your wrongs. And he's waiting. He's prepared paradise for you. And he says, just come home, just receive my forgiveness. His arms are open. That's the ultimate dealing with sin is through Jesus. Engaging in God's good life. Seek restoration with God. Confession and repentance. Come to that place where you say, God, I turn from my sin. I repent of my sin. I'm going to stop talking that way, thinking that way, living that way, doing that, failing to do I'm going to tra- change the way I live as best I can in the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and I'm going to follow you when I receive Jesus and now walk in his power. And you say, well, but sometimes when I do that, I make that commitment and then I struggle and I water back into it. Then repent again and turn again and confess again and keep following Jesus. That's the journey of a Christian. Following Jesus, taking his hand, struggling at times, but then saying, I'm gonna keep following Jesus. That's the challenge for every single one of us. So keep following Jesus and pursuing him. Engaging in God's good life. Seek restoration with people because sin tears apart relationships. We all have relationships that need to be healed again. Whenever you can, wherever you can, go back to people and say, I want to make things right. If you can still do that, if they're still living, if they still have breath in their lungs and you do, do what you can to be restored. You can't make someone else be restored to you, but you can do your part to seek restoration. And God wants that. That honors God. Number seven, engaging in God's good life. Watch for the I would never situations in life. Be Careful when you say, I would never do that. I would never sin that way. 
I would never treat someone that way. The minute you say, I would never, it's like you just put a target on your back and the enemy's coming after you. Because when you say, I would never, you know what you're saying? I would never do that, so you know what? I'm going to drop my guard. I've been a pastor for over 30 years. Can I tell you something? I'll, I'll give you a confession as your pastor to all of you. I understand that there's not a single sin in all the world that I couldn't fall into if I don't stay on my guard. There's no sin I couldn't. You say, Pastor, what's wrong with you? I'm just being honest. I keep my guard up all the time. If you've been part of Shoreline for any length of time, you know I love my wife and I'm crazy about my wife. But I've got boundaries when it comes to other women. If you see me out with, with a woman here anywhere in Monterey, anywhere, anywhere in the world, you see me out for dinner with a woman, it's going to be that woman right there. I also have two sisters. Gretchen, Lisa, no, sorry, three sisters. Allison, Gretchen, Lisa. I, I, you know, I might, but I love two of them. No, that's not, I'm kidding. It's a joke. And if they, if they heard that, they would all laugh because um, I love them all. But, but I don't, you, know, you say, well, what about, like, you know, you would go out for lunch with a 95-year-old woman, wouldn't you? And I'd say, no, because I know I'm a handsome man. And I, no, no, but it's like, I just, I just wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would, now, if, you, if you come by my office sometime and I'm meeting with somebody in my office, if there's a woman in my office, the door will be open or the, or the, window, the big slider on the window will be open and Ramel, my sister, will be outside. Or if Ramel can't be there and I'm meeting with a woman with the window open, I ask my wife to come and sit there with somebody else. You say, oh, you're, you're, just, I mean, that, you're just super careful. Yes, because I want to keep loving my wife and living for Jesus and serving the church to the last breath I take. And I am a broken, sinful man who can be tempted. And so I do all I can to put up those guards. And I encourage you to do the same. Do what it takes. And don't ever say, I would never. I could tell you story after story after story of friends and pastors and leaders I know who came to me as a pastor and said, I gotta tell you what happened. They said, I thought it would never happen to me. I said, that's the problem. And now their whole life's been blown up because they thought it would never happen. And they dropped their guard. Be careful. Engaging in God's good life. Number eight. Beware the old and familiar ruts of sin. Those ruts of sin that you've fallen into in the past, that you've lived that way in the past, you've thought that way, you've talked that way, you've acted that way, and you know what? It's just easy to fall right back into those same ruts again. So be careful of your past sins that you've dealt with, because if you're not careful, you could slide right back into those patterns again. And you know what I'm talking about, because those of you that follow Jesus have at times you go, I didn't, that was the problem for the longest time, and all of a sudden, I'm back there again. Again, be careful of the old familiar patterns of sin because you can end up right back there again. Sin is serious. And the enemy goes, it's no big deal. You won't get caught. It won't cost you. It'll be fun. It'll be delicious. It'll be wonderful. And it's not. It's poison and it's death. God loves us so much. He wants us to walk in a way that honors him. And one more thing about engaging in God's good life. And this comes from the passage again. Enjoy, learn to enjoy and embrace the slices of paradise God gives you this side of paradise. Do you know that God gives you little slices of paradise? Here's Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. And yeah, don't eat from that tree, yeah. But look at all these trees you can eat from. There are so many good blessings. God, God has blessed you. God has given you way more things that are good and wonderful and beautiful that you can enjoy than the handful of things that you shouldn't be involved in. The problem is, we keep staring at the stuff we're not supposed to be involved in. And we don't look up and go, but look at all that God has done and all that God has given. Look at the people God's put in my life. Look at the place God lets us live. Whether you live simply or extravagantly. We live, in Monterey right here, we live in one of the most beautiful places on the planet. God, thank you for your beauty of creation. Thank you for the people. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping, being part of your church. Thank you for free donuts when I come to church. Thank you for, for or, or little oranges if you're into that sort of thing. You know, but just, you know, thank you, right? but see the good gifts. So here's what I want to do as we close. I want to lead you in two different prayers. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you know you've come to the cross and received Jesus, I want to lead you in a prayer. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to pray with me as well. So just quiet your heart. If you have come to the cross and received Jesus, you might have been five years old like my wife was when she truly received Jesus in your teens like I was or something. You might have been in your 70s or 80s, but you know you've received Jesus and he is your savior. If you know that's true, right now, would you just talk to Jesus? And you say, Jesus, I invite you to show me in my life where I'm wandering into sinful practices and my thoughts and my words and my actions and the things I fail to do. Jesus, would you show me the lies of the enemy. 
where I've been believing that I'm never gonna get caught, it's never gonna come out, it's, n- it's no big deal. It's gonna be delicious. But, and maybe even right now you're still kind of enjoying it, but you know it's not God's plan for you. Will you lay that before Jesus right now? Will you say, Jesus, I confess this pattern in my life, this behavior in my life that I know doesn't honor you. I know it's not bringing life to me or anybody around me. Jesus, I confess it and I pray for the power to turn around, to walk the other way and to repent. Jesus, give me power and give me strength this day. Give me the courage to find a couple of friends. I can acknowledge to them I'm struggling and ask them to pray for me and ask me how I'm doing. And give me the awareness of your grace that every time I stumble and fall, I can stand back up and take the hand of Jesus who's never left me, who's waiting there in the beauty of the garden just to to walk with me. Let me not believe the lies of the enemy that just because I stumbled and struggled, I'm now lost my salvation. Let me remember that Jesus died for me, paid the price, and my salvation is based on his grace. Hold his hand and walk with him. And keep praying that prayer all the days of your life. God, help me see the lies of the enemy. Let me hear your truth and walk with you. And then those of you that have never come to the cross and received Jesus, you say, my church background doesn't talk about this, or um, I just never felt like God would love me or forgive me. I feel like my sins are so bad, God can't deal, God doesn't want to put up with all my sins. You, You feel guilt and shame. But you've never come to the cross and received Jesus. If that's you, will you pray this prayer right now? From the depth of your heart, will you pray, Dear Jesus, I don't have it all figured out. I don't have all the answers. But I know enough today to recognize my sins against you. How they separate me from you and from other people. So Jesus, I give you my sins. I give you all my wrongs. I admit them. I confess them to you, Jesus, right now. Jesus, you died on the cross to take my sins and to pay the price. I accept your payment. I accept your forgiveness, Jesus. And I want to walk in your truth. I want to walk in your ways. So Jesus, now I not only give you my sins, but I take your hand. And I want to walk with you all the days of my life. When I stumble, when I wander from following your path, Help me turn around and start again and again and again, knowing, Jesus, that you've never let go of me, you've never left me. It's I that run from you. If you prayed that prayer, whether you're online or on campus, if you prayed that prayer today, God heard that prayer. He has been waiting with his arms open since Jesus rose from the dead for this day. And if you prayed that prayer from your heart, you are now his child, you are now his daughter, you are now his son, and you are now forgiven. And I want to ask you to do one thing before you leave here today, before you leave online. If you're online, I'm going to ask that you would do this. You're going to see on the screen the word faith, and and if you would just text the word faith to the number you see on the screen, we will get that, and we will turn around the next 24 to 40 hours, we will reach out to you and help you start a journey of walking with Jesus. We want to walk with you and help you and encourage you along the way. So if you prayed that prayer and you're online, will you just text the word faith to the number on the screen? And just and, and you know what? Right now, the enemy, Satan's going to start lying to you, saying, don't do it. This is stupid. This isn't real. Just do it. Let us walk with you. Let us encourage you. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. And if you're on campus here today, if you're in the worship center, out in the courtyard, or if you're in the family worship venue, and you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to ask you to not leave here today without talking with one of us. So if you're in the worship center, in just a moment when I give a word of blessing and close our service, nobody else come and talk with Sherry and I unless, but if you prayed that prayer for the first time, come right up to Sherry and I and talk with us. We want to, we want to give you a beautiful Bible. We got these Bibles. It's the same Bible we use here at Shoreline Church, a 50-day reading plan. We have in English and Spanish um, and some next steps to take to grow in your faith, to begin that journey of walking with Jesus. If you're in the worship center, come and talk with Sherry and I in just a moment. We'll be right here in the front. If you're in the courtyard or the family worship venue, I want to challenge you to go out to the, to the pergola, which is out in the courtyard by the grass area, not the gazebo, but the other wood structure there, and Heather will be there, and she will have the same Bible for you and be ready to pray with you and talk with you. And so I want to invite you, if you made that commitment today, don't listen to the lie of the enemy and say, I got to get out of here, but give us five minutes 
to pray with you, to talk with you, and to give you a Bible. We'd love to do that. Dear Jesus, as we close our time together, we thank you that you are the God of truth. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. We want to walk in your truth this day and every day, all the days of our life. Help us to do that, we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Before I have you stand, and before I send you off with the word of blessing, I'm going to give a couple quick invitations. Number one, if you're a young adult, I checked with Brandon, who leads this ministry. A young adult at Shoreline Church is post-high school, you know, 17, 18, post-high school, till you're 29. If you're 30 years old, we love you, but you're not qualifying as a young adult. But if you're 29 or younger, so you can join us tonight at 6 o'clock in the courtyard, a time of connecting and hanging out together. And then we got some, some music planned, and I'm going to bring a short message for anyone who's a young adult. Please come. If you know a young adult, send them here tonight at 6 o'clock. It's going to be a great time. I invite you to be part of that. Also, if you have a child or children that have never been dedicated to the Lord, and you love Jesus, and you want us to pray over them and dedicate them to the Lord, we would love to do that at 1 o'clock today. There will be a, a dedication orientation class online. So all the details are on the website. There's details up here on the screen right now. But just go on the website, click on that, and it's going to be an online time to talk about dedicating children. Also, if you want prayer, we have teams in the front here that would love to pray with you. We've got multiple teams. One, two, three, four, four or five teams available here. We want to pray with you. So if you're in the worship center and you have a joy or a need, come forward for prayer. If you are online... We want to pray for you, so you can call the number you see online. Someone's waiting to pray with you, or you can text us your prayer needs, and we'll pray for you there. And if you're in the family worship venue, or if you're out during the courtyard, uh, we will have a prayer person up by the big screen, the jumbotron in the courtyard up there to pray with you there. But prayer is powerful. Join us for prayer after the service. And if you're new, a warm welcome. If you're online, just text the word welcome to the phone number you see. We will reach out to you, and we want to get to know you personally. If you're on campus... You can go right inside the lobby right here in the Connection Center. They have a little gift bag they want to give you. And thank you for coming and answering your questions. So don't leave here without us getting a chance to give you a warm personal welcome. If you're able to stand, whether you're online or on campus, if you're able to stand, will you stand with me so I can send you off with a word of blessing? As we close this time online, as we close this time together on campus, may you walk with wisdom, exposing and seeing the lies of the enemy for what they are. May you walk in the truth of Jesus Christ, filled with his power. And may you be so filled with the grace of Jesus that everywhere you go, it overflows to every person you meet. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll come back next week to talk about another lie we need to recognize, expose, and deal with. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Sunday.